Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. My sincere thanks to listeners and those who have liked, subscribed, and commented. Your interest is noticed and deeply appreciated. Today's topic is how to make the most out of your training time. Let's start with a simple question which is very common to new students. How many times a week do I need to study Aikido to learn it? Usually this question comes from the standpoint that the student has other life obligations and must fit training into their schedule, which describes almost all of us. We'd love to train six to seven days a week for many hours a day, but life just doesn't allow us that luxury. The simple answer to that question is that most people tend to do pretty well going to three to four classes a week. Less than that, and it will take a long time to build skill. Just like learning anything, say piano, how good would you be if you play once a week versus several times a week? The answer is, the more you practice, the better you get. It really all comes down to that simple principle. I've heard some students say that they eagerly jumped into Aikido and trained four to six days per week, but were not able to sustain it. After a few months, they hit the saturation point and had to back off. Now, when I started, I went to every class my dojo offered, which started at three classes per week and then expanded to four, and I could still not get enough. Over the span of about four years, I think I missed two classes, and even set up some additional training time outside of class as well as attended other martial art classes. By the time I was brown belt, I was doing five days a week and saturation was never a problem for me. Then again, when I get into something, I tend to dive into it pretty deep. I could see where it might be difficult for some. The physical aspect of training can make it challenging, especially in the beginning. The first few months always seem to be the hardest because you haven't learned Guru Kemi yet and you take some bumps and bruises as you learn. The dojo I trained at was fairly physical, and the classes resulted in a sweat-soaked gi every time. While we trained with good intensity, injuries were extremely rare, and we had a good safety record. I'm glad because injuries can really reduce training time. In my case, two separate knee injuries sidelined me for several months each. One was Aikido-related, and the other was not. The Aikido-related one was that I didn't turn my foot as I threw uke and I strained my knee, not that I was thrown too hard or had nage who lacked control. Anyway, this taught me the lesson of how precious training time is. Even when I couldn't get on the mat, I came to class and observed from the sidelines. This was far more interesting and informative than I thought it would be. I got to watch and analyze students who were struggling and look for what the first thing that would help them would be. Of course, comments from off the mat are poor etiquette, so I kept quiet, but I took the opportunity to study and learn. My analysis skills improved a great deal during that time, which really helped my teaching ability. Use all of your time to your advantage. It would have been easy for me to stay home and nurse my knee, but there really wasn't any Aikido learning to be had there. Back to the subject of how much time to spend training, this question starts things off. What are your goals? If you want to be a competitive boxer or wrestler, training three to four times a week is grossly insufficient. If you want to compete, you will need to be training three to four hours per day at least six to seven days a week, maybe more. Most people who train in martial arts are not at this level of commitment. Aikido especially has no such competition to prepare for, which makes people who want to pursue Uchideshi level of practice extremely rare. Uchideshi are live-in students who only eat, sleep, usually clean the dojo, and train. Their training typically consists of six to eight hours per day. The vast majority of those who pursue martial arts training are not training to be professional or semi-pro level practitioners. If we use the piano analogy, They want to play for a hobby and fun, not be a concert pianist. Maybe they want to learn to be good enough to play in a band in a few years, but that's not their driving goal. They're happy to learn at a fairly leisurely pace, although they still want to make tangible progress. This comes to a fundamental question any student should have an answer to. What level of skill is it you seek? The second question is, how quickly do you want to get to that level? Learning a martial art is a bit like learning music or a foreign language. Never think that in a few months you can be fluent. You'll start building some skills, but it takes time to build them fully. People often fall into the trap of wanting quick results. The best martial arts world example is the one-day self-defense class. Usually this isn't even a full day, but a one- to two-hour class. I've hosted these myself and showed as best I can the most useful and memorable material for when someone might need it when they're attacked. It's important to me that if someone is interested in learning to defend themselves that I try to help them. However, I always have to point out that just taking one class is not going to build the skill and fluency with the material that I show them. It requires practice to improve and consistent study, just like music. 
How good would somebody expect to be who had one single piano lesson and never practiced again? Then sometime in the next 10 years, they need to give a piano recital. This example is an extreme one, but you can see the parallel to self-defense and how absurd the prospect is of having one single class be sufficient. Just because stuff looks simple and easy to remember doesn't mean that they will be able to perform it having practiced it one time. Although we can clearly see the reality here, that doesn't mean that we can or should go far into the opposite direction either. Telling a student they must study for 10 years diligently before they can have useful skills is wrong too. Not only does this demoralize students, if you are a teacher you are setting up your own excuse for poor teaching. A good teacher builds skill and understanding in their students fairly quickly. Other martial arts and sports build useful skills which are practical within about six months. Boxing, wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and a few others do well at this. Many traditional martial arts have overcomplicated their curriculum and made it take a long time to get through. Instructors often pass down what they were taught to obscure the real stuff of their art to make students stick around for many years in order to learn the secrets. It makes sense because you make more money as an instructor when students stick around for a few decades. If you want to get extremely good, it will take 8 to 10 years or more depending on your dedication and aptitude. But that doesn't mean you will be useless until you get that far along. If someone tells you or implies their art has secrets and that you only get exposed to them after years of training and you prove your dedication, that should be a huge red flag. There are no such things as secrets, just knowledge that you don't have yet. When they tell students stuff like that, they are withholding knowledge from students and that is not what good teachers do. Don't just walk, run away from instructors or dojos with this attitude. An example of curriculum scope creep comes from post-World War II karate, although it happens in many martial arts dating back to the 18th century and probably even further. One style of Okinawan karate was brought back to the States by an American soldier who spent a few years training there after the war. He came back with about 30 kata he had been taught, which comprised most of the system that he had been taught, and he opened a school. The Reader's Digest version of the story that I heard was that he found it fairly quick to teach his students those 30 kata and noticed that they got bored just doing them over and over again. Bored students tend to leave, thinking they have gotten all the way through the curriculum. So he started inventing his own kata, and today his style of karate has over 300 kata. His school branched out into a franchise, so clearly this strategy is a financially successful one because he keeps students coming back until they learn all of them. A big part of this is the merit badge thinking that many Americans tend to have. This is why belt levels are so alluring and people pursue accolades and ranks more than they do skill. But that's a whole nother topic. Since the vast majority of martial arts students are part-time students, let's focus on how to make the most of their training time. Let's look at this both from the student's point of view and then from the instructor's point of view, which is also the dojo point of view. As a student, get it firm in your mind what your commitment level is. If you decide to be at three classes per week, stick to it. Make training your habit. If you're a swimmer, you swim. That's what you do. If you have to force yourself to go and skip half of your swim times, you're not a swimmer. You're a dabbler. The very same thing applies to going to even one class per week. Sure, you'll get farther doing three classes per week instead of one, but if you cannot reliably show up to even one class, how long do you think it will take to build competence? It will take a damn long time. When you look at yourself a year later, be realistic about why you don't feel you're making much progress. You are responsible for getting to class first and foremost. The second thing is where your mind is when you get to class. If you tend to show up late or your mind is distracted and you're not focused and attentive, then you're not getting all you can be out of being there. You will get out of martial art training exactly what you put into it, and merely having your body on the mat is not enough. Your mind and your spirit must be there too. Sometimes students think the reason they are not learning is their instructor isn't a very good teacher. This can happen and often does, but the teacher-student commitment is a two-way street. Even a skilled teacher will find limited or no success with a student who is not fully present or committed. So be a good student and be fully in the moment. This is a fundamental of martial arts training where you must learn to focus on the here and now because you are training for when your life could be on the line. Will you be distracted or not focused when you're facing a live attacker? I assure you, in that moment, your full attention will be on the here and now. Train with that same attention. Third thing is to add to your learning by not leaving what you've learned behind when you step off the mat. 
Some students check in and out of the dojo like a factory worker punching in and out of their job. When they leave the dojo, their mind doesn't think of improving their skills until the next class. There are a number of methods which are helpful here. One is journaling. After class, when you get home, sit down and write out the techniques that you learned and the lessons that you took away from the class. Use a pen and paper instead of typing out the notes. The act of connecting your mind to the physical act of writing helps build stronger memories of the lesson. When I did this, I spent my drive home going over every technique in my head to help me remember what we did so my notes contained everything. It didn't always work, but putting mental energy into absorbing what I was taught helped me. Of course, practicing movements at home during your day is very helpful. Even if you only do a minute or two here and there, doing this several times a day is very helpful in getting your body to move correctly. I show my students how to do this, and the beauty is you don't need to make extra time in your day or a partner to practice them with. You can practice movements frequently and do it when you have a free moment here or there. The more you practice, the better you will be. Another method is visualization. There are articles and studies about how visualizing yourself doing motion successfully helps with performance. One article I read about visualization studied groups of people and tested how well they did doing free throws in basketball. I don't recall the exact numbers because I read the article many years ago, but one group practiced free throws for an hour per week or something like that. The second group didn't practice at all, and the third group practiced a half an hour a week but did visualizations in between those half-hour training sessions. That involved them closing their eyes and picturing themselves throwing perfect free throws. They would just imagine it in their mind. After a month or so, all three groups were tested again for progress. The visualization group improved far more in their performance than the other two by a wide margin. Visualization is a useful tool. It's not a substitute for training, so don't stay home eating pizza and watching movies just because you did some visualization. Just use a bit of your downtime to be productive. In class, as you start getting comfortable with a technique, push yourself to find what makes a technique break down. Have your uke act more unpredictably and provide resistance. You learn more by failure than by doing easy walkthroughs successfully each time. This feels good, but is like making a full meal out of Oreo cookies. It's not nourishing or good for you. Try to push beyond your limits. If your uke is not engaged, tell him to step it up a little. Your partner is your training tool, so direct him to help you. The last advice I have for students is voice your interest to your instructor or your instructors. Don't remain silent and merely expect that they will fulfill your interests. Talk to them, get to know them, build a rapport with them. The more they know you and understand what you're interested in, the better they can help fulfill your interests. You'll get the most out of them when they understand where you're coming from and where you want to go. That brings us to how instructors can make the most of training time. I'd say the golden rule of teaching is that training time is not about you, it's about your students. Sadly, the martial arts world is filled with egomaniacs and bad instructors who believe teaching class is all about themselves. This usually means classes are not very productive and the students don't enjoy them very much. They only endure because they want the skill but they aren't having a good time and usually find it difficult to learn. The student is your customer and they expect the instructor to build their skills and capabilities. If by the end of the class they aren't markedly better at something than when the class started, the instructor has failed. From what I've seen, this is a common occurrence. The fact is there are extremely few really good teachers out there and that goes for all fields, not just martial arts. Put the same dedication toward the skills of teaching as you did training your art. They are totally different skill sets. Just because you're an excellent martial artist or technician doesn't mean you will be a good teacher, but you can learn. Learn by looking at your students and watching their responses. Monitor their growth both in a single class and over weeks. Be demanding on yourself and don't let excuses creep in. The progress of your students is your responsibility. That is advice on a personal level. On a dojo or organization level, make sure your instruction is clear and built on solid basics. Some instructors are all over the place and throw whatever comes to their head at their students and classes can seem very fragmented. This should be avoided. As the founder of my own independent dojo, I've enjoyed the freedom of being able to rearrange my curriculum and test criteria. Actually, I overhauled it to be far more clear and focused on getting practical skills to my students in the first six months. I could only do this because I didn't have an outside source imposing a curriculum upon me. Granted, I evolved this over time and I didn't do it suddenly. 
Consistency is key and changes should be gradual. Drastic and sweeping changes are hard on students. There are two primary methodologies when teaching a martial art. One, and very common in the traditional martial arts world, is to teach every technique in the system and make sure every student knows them all. This approach seems comprehensive, and it is if quantity is the goal. The old saying, jack of all trades and master of none, applies here. Training in this way almost ensures that students do not excel at any given technique or set of techniques. Sure, some will come easier than others, and they will be better at those. However, since techniques, which are picked up fairly quickly, tend to get left behind as instructors move on to other techniques, the result is that very little training time is spent on those techniques. I've found that techniques which come quickly tend to be simple, direct, and reliable. I believe these are more of the meat and potatoes of an effective martial artist. The second methodology is to train students in a subset of the techniques of the art to the point that they get a high level of proficiency in them. Usually these are techniques they take to naturally and build success with quickly. You can teach other techniques, but they do not consist of the majority of the training time you spend in class. Usually this methodology is used to train people for competition, where they will be facing a live opponent and they need some solid tools, not just a smattering of many techniques. If you think about it from a self-defense standpoint, the simpler and more direct, the better. Someone in a panic is not going to remember a technique they did one or two classes a year ago. They have a far better chance if they have trained in a few reliable techniques many times since they started. Just something to think about as you compose your classes. You don't need to make all of class like this, but make sure to dedicate some training time in every class to the simple, reliable stuff that is straightforward, not fancy or complex. Remember this simple truth. You get good at what you practice, and what you don't practice, you don't get good at. A good teacher always pays attention to how much time he devotes to the most useful and practical skills. He doesn't let class stray too long or too far into obscure or complicated material which is not terribly useful or relevant. Of course, you're free to choose which training methodology you prefer, but realize what the strengths and weaknesses are. I believe the teach the entire system method takes a long time and tends to frustrate students who would like to see tangible progress in a reasonable time. I also believe it builds mediocre students instead of highly proficient ones. I've found that the specialized approach is received well and students can see their confidence build quickly. They don't care that they aren't working on every single technique that Aikido has to offer. They can get that in time once a solid foundation is built. Just as I advise students to talk to you, I advise you to talk to your superiors if you feel improvements should be made to the training process. Don't just sit in silence as you feel things could be done better. Too many organizations are essentially cruising on autopilot and holding on to standards which are not innovative or growing. If you're happy with what your organization is doing and it's working, then great. If not, it's your responsibility to step up and sponsor improvement. Silence will yield no positive result. As an instructor, you set the tone. If your heart and passion is not in your teaching, it's obvious and plain for everyone to see. Engage your passion and energize your students with it. Push them a little beyond their current limitations and make it fun for them. Show them you support them and believe in them and they will rise to the occasion. Too many instructors are bored and disengaged from their students. A distracted or disengaged teacher is no better than a distracted or disengaged student. In fact, it's far worse and will kill a dojo or practice group in pretty short time. If you can, look at everything you teach and ask yourself, is this making the most of the limited time I have with my students? In doing this, I've left behind exercises and teaching that just weren't productive enough to justify spending class time on them. I bring them out once in a blue moon, but the vast majority of my class time is spent on practical skills. My Aikido lineage goes through Koichi Tohei in his pre-Ki society days, so I will teach key exercises from time to time, but I always follow it by putting that movement to a practical technique or set of techniques. Students respond very well to this approach. Lastly, if you go into classes thinking, I can't wait for this to be over, instead of being excited to build skill and understanding in your students, you should seriously rethink your reasons for teaching. If there's a problem that is creating that attitude in yourself, face it and fix it as soon as possible. If you don't have the passion to train, why should your students? You are the guide and they will follow your example. In the end, come into your training, whether you're a student or an instructor, with a positive attitude. 
Always be looking to push past your boundaries, kind of like a weightlifter who wants to increase his personal best. Find out what you can innovate in yourself, your dojo, and your art. Not doing that is like making a Xerox copy of a Xerox copy of a Xerox copy. Eventually, the image loses quality. Many martial arts have distorted and degraded by merely trying to copy itself onto students and losing signal each time. It's important to keep training vibrant and dynamic. A martial art is a living thing, and as such is either growing or it is dying. Make sure you and your art are growing. What are other topics you're interested in hearing covered in this podcast? Please share your ideas in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. You can also go to the Facebook group Aikido the Martial Side and post a comment. Your input and engagement helps podcasts like these stay around. Please support it by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Enjoy your training.